it's a great pleasure to welcome you today to the first event in our executive hospitality and tourism management series titled The Current Trends and Challenges in Hospitality and Tourism. My name is Gerhard Appelthaler. I'm the Dean of the School of Management here at Cal Lutheran, and I have the great pleasure to introduce the President of Cal Lutheran, Dr. Chris Kimball. Thank you, Gerhard. I add my welcome to his and all of you here at this uh, really important event. Uh, it's meaningful in a couple of ways. Uh, one, I think all of us at the university take pride in opportunities to bring events of service, of interest, of relevance to the community, particularly the business community, and to address uh, what is such an important and growing industry worldwide, but particularly in this area uh, as well. I think um, it's also nice when two of our three panelists are alums from the university. Rudy, somehow we have to get you into a degree program um, <laughs> along the way to do it. So um, it, it's great to see alums that have gone on to great success and uh, really appreciate you being here uh, tonight, all three of you. Um, but one of the other reasons I think it's fair to say this is important because of our hopes that before too long, Dean Appelthaler, that hospitality management will be part of the degree offerings here at Cal Lutheran. We know the faculty has to do their formal review, but this is all uh, something that has really taken shape through the support and the vision really of the Dean and then supported by an advisory group, including uh, one of our regents, my bosses, Rick Lemo here. Uh, and so we owe a great uh, debt to all those folks for the work that's gone into this and what we hope will uh, end up being a really marquee program in hospitality management. So uh, an exciting evening uh, ahead and uh, it is always a joy to welcome people to this campus and I know we're going to have a tremendous, uh, tremendous evening tonight. And to the panelists, I look forward to provocative uh, comments. Um, and, well, Udo, I don't know what we're going to do with you. Why? Um, well, I was thinking we should have a wine tasting now. <laughs> so somehow that the discussion will loosen up and be more informal. Well, and, and I also thought, given your when you return to academia, granted you're now living in Texas, but Durham, New Hampshire, UNH, the weather is much better Too here. Cold. The weather is much better here. So I think we need to get him on board as the program uh, launches. So again, to everybody, welcome, and uh, let's have a great evening. Gerhard. So why are we here tonight? Uh, we are here, of course, because the hospitality industry is of tremendous importance for not only the United States, but especially also California and our region. Uh, for those of you who are following uh, the global economic trends uh, and the economic trends in our backyard, the hospitality industry is one of those few that is growing by all metrics. It's growing by spending, by revenue, by employees. Uh, much of the GDP growth in the region has been due to a growth in the hospitality industry. The other reason why we're here is because there's a dedicated group of people who uh, about two years ago got together and decided that what the industry around us needs is more talent, a more solid talent pipeline, and has helped us at Cal Lutheran with the development of a hospitality management program that President Kimball has briefly mentioned and which uh, hopefully will get uh, formal approval very soon so that we can get started with it in the fall of 2018. I would like to recognize some of those people who have helped in the development and who are helping with their presence here tonight. Uh, uh, Rick Lemo has already been mentioned of uh, Caruso Affiliated and uh, a region at Cal Lutheran Board of Regents. Rick, thank you for being here. Thank you for your support also. We have a few industry insiders who were uh, part of the, or still are part of the advisory group for the program development. We have Mr. Jim Cathcart, Jr. here, who is the HR director for the Four Seasons Westlake. Jim. <laughs> I have seen uh, Jane Lee Winter. Jane, where are you? <laughs> Town and Country Travel. 
Um, I also, we also have an advisory council member here from the School of Management, Mr. Jay Bradshaw of Disney Corporation. Jay, thank you for being here. Uh, and we have uh, Sulin Rubalkava of uh, the Ventura County Office of Education. Sulin, where are you? Thank you. I would especially also like to thank uh, the Cal Lutheran students who are here tonight and a group of uh, high school students from Oxnard High School that are in there in the culinary arts tra uh, track, right? Is that correct? Oh, Channel Islands High School, I'm sorry. Channel Islands High School who have joined us here tonight for the program. Uh, special thanks go to Roadrunner Transportation uh, who is sponsoring the event and who has been providing a bus for the students to get here. And also my team at the School of Management consisting of Susan Wood and Jules Soyland and Kim Nakano who have made sure that this event uh, is successful. Thanks to you all. And I also just saw Felix Wang walk in the door from the Best Western Thousand Oaks, uh, also an advisory board member for the hospitality program. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce our panel that I'm very proud of. We have some uh, top-notch industry experts here. And let me start with my fellow Austrian, Rudi Schreiner, who was born in Vienna, Austria, when he traveled to the Amazon in 1974 he designed his first ship using what he could find to build a raft that would take him down the river during uh, the course of five months. And soon thereafter, he thought that he should make travel his business. After years of success in the industry, Rudy decided to start his own venture, and that's when he teamed up with Christine Karst and Jimmy Murphy to start a river cruise company called Ama Waterways. And now, only 15 years later, Ama Waterways is an award-winning cruise line whose fleet will number 22 ships in 2019. Rudy was recognized by travel agents nationwide as the most innovative river cruise executive for the last few years in a row. In June 2016, the Cruise Lines International Association inducted Rudy into its Hall of Fame, presenting him with the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award and informally dubbed him the godfather of river cruising. Thanks for being here, Rudy. And yes, we will get you that Cal Lutheran degree eventually. <laughs> Alicia Harshfield is the executive director of the California Restaurant Association uh, Foundation, the philanthropic arm of the statewide advocacy group, working on behalf of the state's 90,000 restaurant locations. In her time with the foundation, Alicia has established several successful new programs, including the Force in Training or FIT program, which focuses on job readiness training for youth and restaurant care. She's a longtime member of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. She also is active with the Council of Hotel and Restaurant Trainers. A native of Sacramento, California, Alicia studied communication here at Cal Lutheran and now lives in Carlsbad with her husband and two beloved dogs. Thank you, Alicia, for coming back. <laughs> Tom Holt is the founder, CEO, and chief believer, you have to tell us what that is, Tom, of Urbane Cafe. He graduated also from California Lutheran University. After college, Tom opened a juice bar in Camarillo, California, called the Juice Stop. Tom continued to open three more successful locations and developed one of the first mobile juice trailers. In 2002, he sold all his juice bars and decided to open his own restaurant concept. He saw the need for healthy and delicious sandwiches and salads centered around freshly baked bread. Urbane Cafe was born in September of 2003 in Tom's hometown of Ventura. In the summer of 2017, Urbane Cafe received an investment from Panda Restaurant Group to help with the growing expansion of the restaurant chain. Tom is also currently on the state board of the California Restaurant Association, and he is an active member of the Young Professionals Organization. Welcome, Tom. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, another member of the Austrian invasion of the United States, <laughs> Dr. Udo Schlendrich. 
He's a graduate of the Lausanne Hotel Management School in Switzerland, of Cornell University, and he holds his PhD from Strathclyde University in Scotland, one of Europe's leading business schools. For three years, he held the position as chair of the hospitality management program of the Scottish Hotel School at Strathclyde. In 1999, Dr. Schlendrick joined the hospitality department at the business school uh, of the University of New Hampshire, where he was the founding director of the Rosenberg International Franchise Center. Prior to entering academia in a full-time capacity, Dr. Schlendrick held CEO and senior board level positions with leading American and international hospitality organizations such as Hilton International, Stackers UK, and Omni International Hotels and Resorts, of which he was a founding member. During 25 years of his career in the hospitality industry, he has managed properties with an asset value in excess of $8 billion, including the Regency Hotel in New York City and the Dorchester Hotel in London. He served as chairman of the marketing committee of two luxury international hospitality consortia, preferred hotels and resorts with over 120 properties and Steigenberger hotels and resorts with about 230 hotels and resorts. Udo has been of tremendous influence to me personally and has helped tremendously with the development of our future hospitality management program for which I'm very thankful, Udo Schlendrick, he will moderate our event. Thank you very much for being here. Well, if I ever made a mistake, uh, I should not have gone to Cornell. I should have graduated from your university here. The weather is better. The wine is better. The infrastructure for tourism is better. Uh, what was I thinking about studying in Ithaca, New York, where it's snowy, rainy, and muddy? Uh, but this was my past. Uh, I'm here because a friend of mine, John Nutter, who created the uh, Westlake, uh, the Westlake development, uh, he called me one day and said, there's a friend of mine, a fellow Austrian of yours, Udo, he wants to start a hospitality program uh, at CLU, you should talk to him. Uh, I had known John for some 35 years. When John calls as a friend, you just follow him. Uh, I met Gerhard and I was uh, really impressed by his desire uh, to launch this program of hospitality and tourism. Uh, I've been blessed by this industry and I'm extremely pleased that these young students are here because the business to me has been extremely rewarding. Uh, why is it rewarding? It's global, it's international. You deal with people at the back of the house and the operations of all walks of life. Uh, it has given me the opportunity to somehow be a voice uh, which really enjoyed working with all kinds of nationalities all kind of religions, uh, and it has been profitable, profitably emotionally, but also profitably uh, financially, because it allowed me to go back uh, to academia, uh, to teach, to do research. Uh, I spoke to these students uh, over here a second ago. Uh, we will shortly uh, set up a joint uh, profit agreement. I will give them a contract, and 5% of their future earnings will be mine, because <laughs> <laughs> I can't make it on the salary of a professor. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I feel privileged being here. The first time I came to California was when I retired as a firefighter uh, in Alaska and with my Californian friend, we drove down Highway, one, Highway 101 and it was amazing. Highway 101, then we made a shortcut over uh, from Russian River uh, and uh, explored uh, Napa Valley uh, solely for cultural reasons, uh, testing the wines for free and the wines were amazing. When I graduated from Cornell, I was hired uh, by Hilton International to set up the first international wine program, which is really a tough job. So I had to come back to California, retest the wines, and we were the first in 1971 to develop a wine program internationally. Um, the rest is history. My career moved me to many different parts of the world, but the purpose today is to uh, give you some background information. Not everyone here is familiar uh, with the industry, so we provide a little background information. You're required to take notes because we will have a quiz afterwards. Uh, the winner might get a complimentary cruise. We haven't negotiated this yet with Rudy. But uh, so let me give you some thoughts and some ideas here about the industry. First of all, uh, Rudy's timing of uh, launching this hospitality tourism program uh, is really perfect. Um, on a personal note, Ru Gerhards, I mean, Rudy, but you were so important in getting us going here. Um, 
the hospitality program uh, has been supported by the United Nations. 2017 has been declared by the United Nations as the year of international tourism development. And the reason for this is that it contributes uh, to the Millennium Fund. As you know, the Millennium Agreement is to help people who live in poverty to get out of the uh, 2.2 billion live in poverty out of the base of the pyramid to find opportunities to make an own living. The top-down approach just doesn't work. Aid doesn't work. Uh, the money is filtered away before it ever reaches the people at the bottom of the pyramid. So the United Nations is interested in this particular industry and so are other multilateral organizations, whether it's the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, OECD, everyone feels that this is the topic, this is the profession for which there is a strong, strong future. Uh, I just give you a few numbers here. Uh, why tourism, during the past 25 years, the industry has seen and experienced extraprudential growth um, exceeding 4% average, outperforming every other industry just about in the world. The next 15 years have e as well been projected to grow between 3.8 and 4.2%. Uh, globally, tourism accounts for 10.2% of total employment. Out of 10 employees, one is engaged in jobs directly related to the tourism industry. Uh, in numbers and cents, if you want to look at some zeros, you should. The industry GDP contribution worldwide amounts to $7.2 trillion, a mega number. And the industry is to grow further. Chinese is, of course, a major market. Only 5% of the Chinese have a passport. So here's a segment which will grow as well tremendously in the future. Now, as far as CLU is concerned, uh, I see the president is still here, so I have to make a big uh, introduction about the importance about the industry, but he mentioned it actually earlier, he's aware of it. Um, the proximity of this particular university to leading institutions, tourism institution, uh, is, is an incredible gift. When I studied in Ithaca, we maybe had 1% of what you have here. Uh, institutions which have formed our industries were formed in California. You know, the wine industry, we, I just mentioned briefly, Robert Mondavi was a leading light, a good friend of mine. Uh, today, you have 23 million people uh, come yearly just to Napa Valley. Uh, one important segment. Uh, those of you who are elder here, uh, there are not too many, uh, enjoyed as well the gifts which I had by drinking wine for free. Uh, don't even try it, now you have to pay when you go to the vintners. Uh, women, women have and have had a strong impact on our industry. Alice Waters, I don't know how many of you know about her, with Chez Panis, uh, really changed the approach of the restaurant industry. From prepackaged food, uh, we now, she really developed this concept of market to table. Uh, this lady out of nothing became an icon and we in Europe now copied her. Uh, Jeremiah Towers, another player who started the informal restaurant concept in San Francisco from stars, changed the industry. Uh, I can go on. O of course, Walt Disney and many others were pioneers in changing and affecting our industry. So our future students, if this program can be launched hopefully as soon as possible, are part of an environment which is so extremely promising to do their internships, to have a career, to grow not just within your state, but also nationally and internationally. Faculty has incredible opportunities for their research, for outreach, for consultancy. So we are in a location here. The reason I'm here is because this is a win-win situation. And I'm as excited as Dean Gerhard is and all of you here that this industry will have and has a bright future. So the growth which we have seen, however, we cannot take for granted. The environment in which we operate is also very fragile. So we have to ensure that we maintain uh, the ecology, the environment. Uh, as you know, tourism is also greatly impacted by crime as we have recently experienced, unfortunately, in Las Vegas uh, by sectarian uh, strives, uh, by revolutions. Um, it is an industry which we never can take for granted. And here again, the university has a role to play uh, to point out uh, the advantages and potentially the dangers. Irresponsible planning, a huge issue. Uh, we have used uh, Pebble Beach as an example of responsible planning. The 17-mile drive does not exist in Europe. 
doesn't exist in Pattaya, it doesn't exist in Bali, it doesn't exist in Mexico and Acapulco. Some, um, I think it's Mr. Garber who was one of the railroad tycoons, master planned the 17 mile drive. In other parts of the world, you would have apartment buildings and condos stacked up in front and we wouldn't have this wonderful place uh, which we now can experience uh, people of all walks of life. So without any further ado, let's just have a look what tourism is all about and give you just some brief background information uh, before we go into the panel discussion. I see Ryan Dyer there. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, the industry itself, as we say in my country, ein Moment bitte, uh, technically challenged. Uh, here's an overview of the industry, highly interdisciplinary, very fragmented, but united under this label tourism. Today, uh, we will have, of course, the world's expert here in the cruise ship field, and we will address the restaurant sector. But all the other areas are virtually providing jobs for millions of people. It is a large industry. We will cover these segments in later discussions, in later seminars. My expertise was in real estate development and the operation of luxury hotels and hotel chains. In terms of direct related jobs, as far as California is concerned, over one million jobs are provided directly as a result of the tourism industry. Secondary employment, it's not secondary, but it's the, are the vintners, are the farmers, the construction industry, the computers, the accountants, uh, even a few lawyers, maybe too many of those. Um, direct tourism spending, let me go back, uh, in California exceeds 126 billion, substantial amount which contributes uh, toward the well-being of the state. I, I know the tech industry is, quote, uh, very famous, but the jobs are provided along all the different classes uh, of people uh, by this sector. In terms of tourism spending, we're interested in the spending of out-of-town, out-of-state uh, individuals. They stay longer, they spend more money, and the spend is substantially higher here. Uh, number of personal trips is one major segment. The other one, they are leisure divided, and they're business trips. Business trips is conventions and meetings and individual business clients. It's market segmentation. The international market, oops, the international market is also significant. 17.3 million people visit California from other countries. Now here, the element of security is important. The international clientele is looking for security. They are looking for a good infrastructure. They're also looking for a service-oriented um, culture. Uh, we have to become better at that. And here's again, the university can play a major role in educating young men and women to really enjoy to be part of a service industry and service sector. Personal, here are the major uh, sub-segments now, leisure and tourism, as you see here, is oops, uh, the third highest. However, without any doubt, it provides more jobs for people of all socioeconomic stratas. There's no single businesses, business where you have, it's highly unlikely that any of you will be the next Steve job. Uh, however, it's likely that you become an entrepreneur like Tom, an entrepreneur like Rudy, and so on. And the industry you represent, of course, uh, is the largest one. The career for women, extremely large. We have done some sampling research up east through my research center. Uh, we have more women as senior executives, more women as owners of business, and minorities. So the industry is really encompassing a broad segment of the population, which is very promising. We like to use a bottle in our discussion later on to look at it from a macro environment. How does, how does the macro environment affect uh, our industry? How do external sources either impede or help us to project growth? So we'll use that model with our panel. Uh, we can go into other directions as well, but it's a diagnostic tool uh, where we will look at macro, the external environment, and then drill it down to the business environment. Why don't we do that? I leave the model on and we'll try to ask some questions to our panel using this model as a guide and we'll see if we have a consensus 
uh, or if any intellectual battles will take place. I don't think so. Um, what I really liked was uh, a Peter Drucker, uh, also again a fellow Austrian. It's just about um, embarrassing. Where are the, what are the Austrians doing here? Austria must be a bad place to live. We all want to come to California. But Peter Drucker, uh, the renowned professor of scientific management, at the end of his life, he wrote about 30 plus books. He was a consultant for the leading corporations in America. Um, at the end of his life, this rich life, understanding business, he was asked by a business journalist, he said, Professor Drucker, if you have one advice, what advice would you give to people who are in business, who want to start a business, to the Tom Holtz? And his answer was, to stay in business. <laughs> well, it sounds very simple, but so often, uh, when I came to America, I learned about football. You know, there's apparently a, a line which you want to cross and you get a touchdown. But in business, too, you can easily be distracted. So to stay in business is not as easy as what we think. He also mentioned, followed a follow-up question was, he says, it is only the entrepreneur which creates value. Governments can somehow level the playing field. Somehow also the playing field can become negative as a result of government institutions. But it's the entrepreneur which is the lifeblood of this nation and the lifeblood of our industry, not just tourism, but above all tourism takes entrepreneurial and creative thinking and risk-taking. I'm sure you all had some sleepless nights uh, trying to establish your business. And my admir admiration goes uh, to uh, the entrepreneurs here of our uh, panel. So the first question I would have is uh, to the panel, how would you evaluate? And let's start with the ladies because we put her on the spot immediately. Alicia, what do you think, to what degree, what, how would you assess the economic conditions presently uh, in this particular state? You represent how many thousand of owners, of restaurant owners? Well, the, can, can you hear me if it's working? The, um, there are about 85,000 restaurants in the state of California, and we represent, as a member organization, approximately a quarter of those um, establishments. And um, interestingly, the revenue, for, uh, sales tax revenue generated by restaurants um, in California is, has surpassed auto dealers and we're the number one generator of sales tax uh, revenue for the state. So it's a pretty big industry yes. and we employ a lot of people. So how would you feel that your industry, the industry you represent, how do they see the existing economic conditions? Well, I Favorable, think where are the problems, where are the issues? Certainly legislation can be challenging, uh, labor can uh, present challenges, the industry is probably in a, um, a season of change, a lot of disruption in terms of what used to work, maybe not working, and new players in the industry, um, uh, segments changing, um, but I think there is overall some growth, um, maybe not as much as in 2014 and 2015, but still, still growth in the industry. Bit. Rudy, how does it look for you? You work more internationally? For us, it uh, actually looks fantastic. I mean, 2017 is again a total high of a year. Uh, looking back, I mean, I'm a Waterway started in 2002. And uh, it was actually Christine, my wife, and myself. Yeah, I build the ships and she fills the ships. <laughs> Today we have about 180 employees in our Calabasas office and uh, things are moving forward very rapidly. And uh, we went through all the cycles, recession in 2008, 2009. Uh, even during the recession years, uh, 2008 and 2009, we were still growing year over year. So, so far every year has been our best year. Now, the river cruise industry is also the fastest growing industry in the travel industry. Yeah, river cruising really started growing here since uh, 1992, 93, and actually I was heavily involved in that part when I was at Uniworld. Yeah, in 93, uh, 94, I started with the Uniworld river cruising uh, segment and opened in 2000 Viking River Cruises here in Woodland Hills. Uh, and. Uh, our impact is an international impact, so uh, as political impacts. Uh, in 2016, yeah, we had a, a, a tougher year because of terrorism in France, 
terrorism in uh, Belgium, that's when Americans are careful in traveling overseas. So 95% of our customer base is North America, U.S. and Canada, about 85, 83% U.S., about a little over 10% Canada, 5% is rest of the world, U.K., Latin America, Asia, and our destination is about 90, a little over 90% Europe, plus we have ships in Vietnam, Cambodia, and also a little, little tiny little ship in Africa. So U.S. market traveling to Europe. What has happened also with us, uh, in 2008, during the recession year, uh, the U.S. dollar was trading at $1.60 per euro. Earlier this year, it went, was as far down as a dollar five. That means our revenue comes in U.S. dollars, our expenses are in euro. So we had a very favorable condition over the last few years, and and we really we didn't inc uh, decrease prices. We increased services. We provided additional services. Um, this year it's a little turnaround, so the, the, the dollar quickly dropped from 105 to 120, so which is affecting us a little bit, but not nothing to worry about. So from our side, it has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time economically. So yeah. when do you go public so we can invest in your company? Uh, it <laughs> <laughs> that's a long, that's another story. <laughs> yeah, but from uh, from. If you look at the entire tourism market, and uh, it, it is slowly getting to the point where some some uh, European cities are wondering what they are going to do with all the tourists. If you look at Venice, at Rome, and so on, and uh, now the Chinese are starting to travel. In, the Indians are not quite there, but once the Indians also will start traveling, like the Europeans are, then you will see an unbelievable number of people traveling. And the other thing that's happening today is uh, people today spend more resources on creating memories, on traveling, than they do on luxury goods which they wouldn't use. Yeah, and I think it has to do with the baby boomer generation, which is still our prime market. Uh, so travel will continue to grow. Yeah, and it has been for us a fantastic run over the last 15 years, and I think it will continue. Yeah, and even the social po political uh, issues like uh, are not influencing anymore. There is so much going on that people just step right over it, and they still continue to travel. So I see just a bright, bright future, and I'm looking forward to having many of your students uh, starting as interns with us and then eventually hiring them. We are just down the road in Calabasas. Thank you, Rudy. Tom, how does it look for you? You started your business how long ago? Uh, it's been 14 years. So our, some of our, we really thrived during the Great Recession. That was one of, because of our value point, we were fairly new to the fast casual scene. So there wasn't a lot out there, and a lot of people were trading down from casual dining, which really made it attractive for us. And what we'll probably talk about today is uh, finding great people to help run our restaurants. And that's a little bit difficult. There's not as many people out there that are joining us in this to get into the restaurant industry. So I see a bright future. I mean, our growth has been, um, our comp sales are very, very good. And we're, we're picking these areas where um, there's a lot of growth potential. As Rudy mentioned, and as you mentioned, as a result of the economic growth, you, the students, are able to enter an industry which requires leadership, they require management. The future is bright. The World Economic Forum, one of the leading economic think tanks, it conducts a study uh, every year, and one of the primary needs which they identified is, as a result of the growth of the industry is the requirement of having expertise in the field to allow them to grow. Um, legislation and regulation we mentioned in a way, I don't want to spend too much time on this, population and demographics. I see, interestingly, a shift of younger people wanting to dine 
in a more relaxed way. Um, to what degree uh, do you feel you have to change your proposition on how you run your business as a result of the change which the younger po population is seeking, i.e. less formal, more informal, more relaxed environment? Uh, do you have to, did you have to change your proposition on how you run your business? For us, we're a fast casual, so it was, it was more people are trading down to us, and I wouldn't say it down because I think our quality is the same, but it's a more relaxed environment, and people feel more comfortable to come in, um, and it's, it's an easier environment. Where we are seeing a shift is, I think technology is starting to be a big shifter in how people are um, coming to restaurants or not coming to restaurants, right? We're, and we'll probably talk a lot about delivery, and, but a lot, of, a lot of it is technology driven. And I think, especially in the fast casual space where we are, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities just in the technology space. I mean, I, I have 12 units and I got a full IT guy. So, I mean, just to figure out how all of these pieces go together, where it's online ordering, apps, um, HR, there's just so many comp components to um, this industry and this, uh, our company. Alicia, what do you see? Well, I think Tom's in, in a good segment of the industry because over the last 10 years, um, speaking to his point about um, people maybe looking for value or changing the way they dine out, um, 10 years ago, 55% of the restaurants were uh, casual dining, so table service, and um, now that's down to 39%. So the growth in the industry has been around the fast casual segment and, and which can encompass even some quick service. So fast casual, people, people are dining differently, looking for value, and I think the delivery piece is important as well in terms of um, how they access their food and where they're, where they're dining. Rudy, are you affected by technology, consumer behavior? Oh yeah, absolutely we are affected. I mean, one thing we have, uh, we, we differentiate a little bit. Uh, our standard uh, package for a couple to go on one of our trips in Europe is in the neighborhood of eight, nine to ten thousand dollars. That's an average package, yeah. So first of all, you have to already look at demographics. Who are the people who can do something like that? They need the leisure time and they need the resources. So our key market today still is the baby boomer. Yeah. We are talking about the millennials and so on. We, are, it, we, we spend a lot of uh, time on it and we are looking into the future how we can uh, access that market more. And it's a different way of marketing also. I mean, today with uh, the, the media, the social media marketing and so on, it's changing things. But our key market is still the baby boomer. So it's a market uh, very different probably to uh, compare to the casual dining or to this. Yeah, I always say, if you look at the cruise industry in general, yeah, uh, compare something like a cruise to the Bahamas out of Hawaii and a cruise to Europe, two totally different things. Yeah, do you drive to the port in Miami or to Fort Lauderdale, you jump on a ship for three, four nights, you get a package for probably $80 or $100 a day, so for $300 you can cruise over the weekend. Once you're on board, they c take you upside down, they shake you until every penny is out of your pocket and then they send you back. Yeah. We, for us, you have to fly high season summertime to Europe, it costs you already close to $2,000 just to get there and get back. You don't want a cheap, uh, quick package. You want classic things. You want the best of the best. So we are in a very different environment, yeah? And, and uh, that upscale environment is really taking off more and more and more. There is more money out there every single day. If you look at the stock market, every day a new record. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many days now in a row. Again, today, I think another new record on, on the stock market. So there is a lot of money out there. There's a lot of spending money out there, and people are eager to enjoy it. So from, from our side, we are, we are talking a little bit about a different thing than uh, the, uh, than the Urban Cafe. I think this is interesting because we have three different sectors and segments represented here. Alicia, you had mm -hmm. another point. 
Well, I think experience is really important, and that speaks to um, the experience they're going to have with your cruise ships and your your luxury travel and those experiences. And I still think, from Tom's side, um, people are ha still have an expectation of quality, and um, they still want a nice dining experience um, and value. And value, yeah. So. You know what is interesting? When I came to this country, <laughs> the food served at our restaurants were mar marginal as, 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 at best. But you have come such a long way in having an appreciation uh, for the quality of service, which requires passion and training. It's not just good enough to consume a product. You like to have an experience. Um, I'm staying now, right now at the Westlake Inn. Uh, there's the Stonehatch uh, Stone, outlet. Hmm? Stonehouse. Uh, Stonehouse. <laughs> uh, amazing. I didn't consume wine there before I came here, so uh, uh, it is amazing how you uh, have recaptured this environment where people can come from all walks of life to have an experience. You can bring your wife, your girlfriend, hopefully not both at the same time. You can bring your dogs. Uh, you, you, you have a place where people can have an atmosphere, and there's a value proposition there. So for the young people, if you want to enter this field, if you're not passionate enough, don't even try to go into it. But if you love it, the fulfillment you can have, but the sophistication, this is the point I was going to make, the sophistication of the consumer today is often much higher than that of the people who serve you. So our challenge is to bring this savoir-faire of service, which has to be sincere, and is very rewarding, back into the field. And our graduates here at CLU have a great opportunity to be trained in both aspects, the academic one, the technology. I have not given credit uh, uh, to Paul, professor in technology. Paul, you, I never thought that people in technology uh, were creative. But you have a professor here who is in technology. Uh, once you let them out of their computer, he is very creative and very supportive. <laughs> However, we link together service, concept, technology, and the academic aspect. And we have to respond to the needs and what these experts see in the field. And we have to present and educate a product, which is challenging, but also extremely rewarding. Uh, if you have children or grandchildren, tell them to come here and study when the program is up and running. Uh, it will be a very rewarding experience for them. Rudy. Just a little comment. Uh, who knows the stone house? Okay, quite a few of you. So the Stonehouse is, is, is a very unique example of what has developed here in this area. Uh, the whole concept of sitting in a vineyard, yeah, just a block off Ventura Freeway, and having a glass of wine in a vineyard is just fantastic. And if you think about it, it used to be a gas station yeah, where the Stonehouse is. I am from Vienna. Uh, in, the, uh, in the surrounding areas, in the villages in the hills of Vienna, we have this concept called the Hariga, wine from this year. So you go to the bar, you s buy your wine, and you go and bring your food, and you sit in the vineyard. And the stone house is kind of a co semi-copy of this concept. And it hit, it's like a, such a huge success. And I, I'm a regular there, and John Nott is a good friend of mine, but this is really something we're looking at what uh, can you do in the environment and the ambiance and what service you can provide. It's a fantastic idea and it's a huge, huge success. Yeah, we know and spend a lot of our youth at the Horrigan in Vienna and Austria. <laughs> and this Horrigan here uh, is better than the one we have in Austria. <laughs> um, and, and Rudy is right. People want to get away from their television. They want still to connect. They still want to have human interaction. However, the man who created it took risk. Right? He took a risk. He says, I'm going to invest in this. He has a dream. He has a vision. These individuals here, our panel, took a risk in starting a business. I'm sure there were moments and opportunities where they said, am I doing the right thing? Uh, again, entrepreneurship creates opportunities, but it requires passion. It provides... It, requires perseverance, uh, and a lot of it is trial and error as well. I don't know how good Rudy would have been without his wife. Uh, and he said earlier, she, is, she brings another dimension. By the way, Rudy, this will make a great case study. You're the only family-owned business 
where I know a husband and a wife work together at such a large organization. In my country, this is what we do. We have little family hotels, but this will make a great, a great, great study. I hope you stay married for a long time. Well, yeah, and she just sent, texted me, she sent me a photo from Canada. She is at the CAA conference in St. John's, up in all the way up north, in the northeast. And today we won CAA uh, Partner of the Year. The, so CAA is a Canadian automobile club. Yeah, so we are the best partner, travel partner for CAA. Well done. <laughs> So this leads me to the next question. There is a competition in your business, in yours, in US, Tom. How do you differentiate yourself? The cruising business has been successful, the river cruising business. How do you create a differentiation to create value to customers that they will choose you as your product or you? Why don't we start with Tom? How do you differentiate yourself from others uh, who are in a similar line of business? What is the unique? There's secret juice you have. So there's there's a ton of fast casual out there. I mean, you, you probably can see all these pizza concepts doing the same thing, make your own pizza. I mean, for us, our dif differentiator is our bread and having a scratch kitchen. Most, most sandwich salad concepts, like a Panera, like a corner bakery, they're bringing in pre-done stuff. We're doing everything from scratch. Um, so the quality, I believe, is one of our differentiator. Um, and our, also, when we talk um, growth differentiator, our, our model is different than going to every um, really hipster location. We're, we're out to feed those people in communities like Thousand Oaks, Ventura, um, communities that um, aren't oversaturated um, with options. And that's where we do really well. Um. So Alicia, the industry you represent, yes. obviously highly competitive, mm -hmm. high failure rate, mm -hmm. also success rate. <coughs> where do you see the successful organizations versus, versus those which might falter? Well, uh, speaking to the students in the room, I, I think an important thing to note about uh, food service, restaurants, hospitality industry is the opportunity that awaits you. Um, and the entrepreneurial spirit, the, the creativity, and um, the innovation that is, especially in a state like California, we are amazing innovators in the industry, and so many concepts have started here and gone on to be successful across the country, and models for, for um, other states. Um, so I think you have to have a, uh, you have to be smart and understand the business, um, and be passionate, so, and, and figure out your segment and your lane and how to do it well and be the best at that so that you can um, thrive and grow um, because there will be competitors in your space and so you, you have to figure out uh, who you are and, ha and stay true to that essence of what your concept is. I mean, think about an In-N-Out burger and the success that they have and what they do. They make burgers and shakes and sell sodas and fries. I mean, that that is, that's their concept. Huge segment of the industry that's growing, chicken. You know, raising canes, chicken fingers, um, Chick-fil-A, chicken. It's just chicken. And it, so it's basically, I, I think, understanding, creating a concept, knowing what it is, staying true to it. But you've got to be smart, and the business piece is really important, too. I'd like to address the question of culture. I've worked in organizations where there was a culture which was empowering, where I left coming to work. I love the industry. How do you keep in your organization, Rudy, a culture which is vibrant, which is exciting? Because day to day, you're basically on stage performing. I mean, first of all, in-house, uh, we are trying to create the kind of best working condition possible. Yeah, so we, are, we, we have the, an entire building in Calabasas. We just recently installed a gym. We actually have four days a week, three training classes people can uh, join free of charge and uh, so we also provide still uh, health insurance free of charge. Uh, we provide one e trip, one cruise per year to every employee free of charge including flights. Yeah, Europe Our applications or Asia. will be taken right now because we all want to and join. 
Uh, and this is not vacation. This is part of the working environment. So anybody can go and can take a companion free of charge along. The companion has to pay for the airfare. So the general idea is I want people to come to the office and enjoy what they're doing. Yeah, then I get the most out of it. Yeah, uh, uh, trying to be the best of what you do. Whatever you decide to do, yeah, try to stay on top. Don't have fear for your competition. Yeah, competition is nice, it's pleasant, it, it challenges you, it, it, it gives you the idea of how can you do better than them. Yeah, so the environment is, f I'm, I'm very friendly to all of our competitors. I mean, I created most of them. <laughs> 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 yeah, and uh, it is really enjoy, enjoy your business environment. Good point. Tom, now some of you might know that Tom was a world-class motorcycle racer. Now Rudy can take his people on a river cruise. You can take them on a race bike. Uh, I don't know whether they will survive, but what do you do in a smaller organization to have this culture? There still has to be a structure. How do you have a structure where your employees and a culture which is growing, empowering? Again, I, I, think, it, I, I think it comes from the top, right? It's, it's spending time with your people and not just walking into the restaurant. So I'm, I'm in our restaurants every day. That's where you build the culture with yourself. So they, I want them to mimic the way I feel hus hospitality is. It's a feeling, right? You're giving that feeling to people, the welcoming feeling. So I want our team to have that same feeling. When, when I come in, they know that I appreciate them. And that's, it's so important to, to build it from my level all the way down. To empower your staff. Tom said something very simple. I am there. He's at the firing line. He's not sitting in the office counting pennies and seeing how he can improve his profit by 1%. So visual management, leading by example, all pretty simple things, but more difficult to be done. Uh, we come slowly to the end of this uh, event. Uh, we might continue at, uh, it's called the Stone House, uh, a, a little later, <laughs> privately or invited. On, on, I, I invite you. Uh, and what are you most worried about? as far as the future is concerned, if anything. Yeah, Rudy. Me. My biggest concern is low water. <laughs> How about high water? Because some of your boats high water go. Ships are built for high water. <laughs> high water goes away. So a high water is not a concern. My biggest concern is low water. I'm not concerned about economic conditions. I'm not concerned. Things go up and down. I've lived through God knows how many things through Cycles. the civil war in Yugoslavia and so on, and where the whole Danube was blocked, and and uh, the uh, volcanoes in Ireland where nobody could fly to Europe anymore. Yeah, 9/11 when all the people on the ship could not fly back and nobody could fly over and so on. So all these things go away. Yeah, low water is my only concern because it might not go away. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, uh, how about issues such as politicians like to tax, sorry I'm cold, politicians like to tax everybody. Mm. The hospitality industry has been very popular <coughs> to raise taxes. We have seen conventions basically desert New York because the taxes became too high, labor regulations became too high. Is that an issue in, in your field, uh, excess government or state control of the entrepreneurs? For the association side, certainly. I mean, our mission is to advocate on behalf of our industry. So when um, legislation is uh, presented that's unfavorable, we're always concerned about um, how we can mitigate the negative effects on um, our members and, and our industry as a whole, and we always worry about unintended consequences, well-intended uh, legislators that might not understand that the bills they're putting forward, how that can affect um, 
labor, I mean, just someone having access to a job and, um, and other unintended consequences that can make it difficult for people to do business. But California is still a great place to do business and companies are still coming here and there's still a lot of growth and innovation and opportunity in this state. Um, you know, 39 million people live here and we like to go out and we like to enjoy ourselves. So it's still a good place for restaurants. It's just sometimes it's a little more challenging and people have to, that own a business, need to rethink how they run their business in order to keep it profitable and keep people coming in. And, and labor certainly is, is a challenge and having good qualified people to, to work in our, in our industry is, is um, important. And that's probably keeping some people awake at night. Thank you. Tom, for you, water's not an issue for you? Water's fine. Well, we're out of the drought, so that's good, right? Um, of course, food safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, uh, for me in the restaurant business, I mean, we have to be, we have to be on top of that. And that, that is something that keeps As you know, the Shipotla, one of the leaders in the food sector, they were hit with a number of issues, food poisoning. Yeah. Uh, That'll keep you up at night. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, ultimately though, it comes back to the people, right? We gotta find the people that wanna follow the systems and make sure that our training is done to our specs. And that's the, the important part. How about Amazon buying Whole Foods, uh, changing maybe the consumption of food, would that be something? Or that, it, Blue, it's a Blue Apron, food in a box? Is that something? It's, it's going to change. The whole the whole model is changing. I mean, we're looking at we were looking at our KPIs today on how many people are using our. Uh, uh, key uh, what, indicator. I don't know. Uh, if they all know. Sorry, <laughs> I was thinking sorry, of kids. <laughs> sorry. Um, so we were we measure all these technology things, and um, from our app, we've grown thirty percent over the last mm -hmm. year, just from our app. So you can imagine, we. We're, the phones are gonna are gonna start dying eventually, I hope, s soon, um, because it's easier. It's easier for the person to go and order and get in and get out. So people either want it delivered or they want to get in and get out. We of course you're all seeing malls change, yeah. right? I mean yeah. the whole the whole mall. <laughs> we of course are all looking forward to the driverless car here in California. Uh, that will come soon, possibly. Any other comments? Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the regulation and legislation, uh, you, are, you, you are still in a country where, in general, you get by very easily with most of the things in comparison to the EU. Yeah, so in, in Europe, you deal from country to country, labor laws are different, and so on and so on. What you do is you adjust to it, and you try to adjust quicker than your competitor, and then you're ahead of the game again, yeah? But you have to live with it. So it's not, you, you don't fight it, you just, try to adjust to it. Things change quickly. I mean, when the president 200 years ago got an idea, he sent out horses to deliver his message across the country. Today he wakes up and takes his iPhone and it's, everybody knows it five minutes later. <laughs> so you have to adjust to the changes, yeah? And it's, a, it's an interesting situation, yeah? <laughs> well, I'm grateful for the presentations. We would like to go now to a Q&A session uh, we have some students here who will pass out the mics. Uh, afterwards, we will reward handsomely our, our panel. Uh, I think the politicians get half a million dollars for each session. We reduce it by 50% uh, as a per diem. Uh, any questions to our audience? Yes. Well, we have a mic. One second, we have some mics here from the ladies. Can everybody hear me okay? Well, we Bring the mic just in case. Would you be so kind when you have a question just to give your name and your affiliation and then the question? Hi, my name is Rick Lemo. I'm one of the regents, but more importantly, I'm with Caruso. And you said something very interesting about malls, and malls are absolutely in trouble. They're in deep trouble, but not all of them. Um, malls who follow the same rule we use for everything, and I believe you guys are using the same rule, Businesses that create experiences go beyond age demographics, go way beyond uh, income demographics, and they allow the employees to fire that passion. Uh, a perfect example is malls have been panicking about um, online businesses for a long time, where many of the centers that create experiences have embraced online, where 5% of the new tenants last year 
were online only tenants for their entire existence before that. Malls who may have sales off five to seven percent, sales at outdoor centers, or I should say at our centers, are up 17 percent. Um, and the National Retail Federation is saying that's going to happen again. I think we need to get beyond retail and talk about the experience everywhere, whether it's the experience in your restaurant, regardless of what you're spending. And the fact of the matter is you, you prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. The people who are saving up their money and looking for value, they want an experience. So how important are restaurants for your malls? I would say for us, they're probably one of the single most uh, important elements. And the reason is we're gathering places. Yes. And in America, you can't gather without food. But for example, we've got somebody who's only had one little shop in, um, in New York, the gentleman who invented the Cronut. He's opening a two-story restaurant at the Grove, which is really you know, unusual. Uh, I just took a tour of the restaurant the other day, and it's magnificent that they do know, you know, I thought to myself, man, the guy makes donuts. They know the business. He's got his own bakery. In, but again, his product is, is not the main thing. It's the experience and the quality of what he's driving. And where he's going. And he's where going to he's, one of your centers. Yeah. Well, he's, he's going in a very good location, good. no doubt. But um, I think the experience sure. is, is the base because it transcends sure. age, it transcends income, and it also transcends each individual category. Uh, so it's something we should really pay attention to. I, I noticed uh, when looking at some surveys just yesterday, or Monday, 55 to 65-year-old people who are into quality and upscale brands, their mid-aged uh, sons and daughters are following that same path. So they're not looking for the cheapest way out. That's quality. Agreed. It's all about quality. Thank you. Any other Questions and comments right here, yes? Hi there, Kitty Dill. I've been in the Caneo since 69 and I know a lot of people here. I wanna thank you for coming here. You don't know how in many ways all of you have enriched my life. Now, as a member of the fake news journalist, <laughs> I'm happy to report. I would say that the two things that have stood me in good stead my entire life is my innate curiosity. My husband says I drive him crazy because I'm so curious about everything. Secondly, I'm passionate about people, and I care about them. So I would like each panelist to tell me, what do you think are your own personal innate qualities that have not only got you where you are, but kept you where you are? Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Alicia, why don't we start with you? We're always so generous advancing the ladies here of this panel. It's a great question. And I think um, being a connector, and uh, so meaning how can I bring people together to see a vision through, and coming up with ideas and things that are going to be um, move the needle and be different, and bringing the right people together to make those things happen. I think that's uh, a strength and passion, passion for me. Oh. OK, I'll give you a short example of an event that kind of will describe my life. When I was uh, 21, I decided to go with my roommate on vacation to Afghanistan. That sounds today awful, but at that time Afghanistan was really kind of the hippie road from Europe. Yeah, 1973, I was 21 years old. And uh, so we actually arranged uh, a the Austrian Sikkim Nepal expedition. We sent out letters to companies to get support and so on. And we ended up going seven months all the way to Nepal through Afghanistan and had four months with rice farmers in Nepal doing research where we even got a scholarship from the Ministry of Education. But here's one scene. We are driving in Iran, in Persia. We are driving in Iran towards the Afghanistan border Everybody, you could not get an Afghanistan visa in Austria. There was no consulate, no embassy. In our Volkswagen van, somewhere in the back, we had three suits and three uh, briefcases. Half an hour before the border, we put on our suits, got our briefcases, came to the border. There were about 20 Volkswagen vans and other vans sitting there. 
Yeah, with all the hippies already probably waiting two, three days to get their visas. We walk into the, into the customs house. Yeah, they are all cracking up when they see us because most of them met us before at different places and so on. We walk in, we come out, we wave at them, and we drive on. <laughs> Some of them still might be sitting there today. <laughs> but that's kind of, it was always an entrepreneurial spirit. So, and when we came back from the trip, I got a contract with the largest Austrian newspaper. I got a contract for 20 weeks, every Sunday, two pages about my trip. And that's how things progressed, yeah. So that's, there was always an entrepreneurial spirit and you always try to outdo what's out there and try to come up with new ideas and better ideas. And it's the same about river cruising. All we try to do, Christine and me, is how can we better the product every single day? That's creativity, never sitting back, and intellectual curiosity, extremely important, and willing to listen to the market and to take chances. Now, some people never take chances, but they will never advance. If you don't take chances, you never make a mistake, don't you? But you won't advance either. Uh, great comments. Tom, what do you do? Oh, let me tell you. Um, first, I was a huge risk taker, but I'll, I'll tell you one of my biggest things was that I care about people. Um, there's no way you can start a business like this and not care about people because you need people to help your vision through. I, I mean, it's just my vision. But if I don't have great people and I'm not a great leader, I'm going to go nowhere. There's no way I can staff a restaurant. So I've always cared about our guests, and I've always cared about their experience, and I've always cared about our team. Because without those two things, I, I can sit on a corner and sell lemonade, but nobody, the person driving by doesn't care about me. i, I got to show them that I care. It takes passion, doesn't it? Absolutely. And this is what all three of you have. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Yes. Sue Landro of Gala Ventura County Office of Education. And this is kind of a question for the students that I wanted to ask. And one of the challenges that I've been seeing is that the hospitality tourism industry is a need of workers, right? Absolutely. And it's usually the experience that gets you to the next level, to management level. It's like you have to work through that to get to a higher level. So I kind of see how does the degree going to differentiate a student that's working up to that versus someone that actually has a degree. And I see a little bit of a challenge because it, some of them are like, oh, well, the degree doesn't really matter because we need someone to just move them up because we need a body in there to work. Um, so how do you guys feel that will make an impact in your industry? Well, Alicia. I, I represent our foundation uh, for, and how are you? Nice to see you. <laughs> um, for, for, and so we're all about um, education, and we think that not only just because of what it can do for a career in terms of building blocks, but because of the experience. Um, and particularly if you're uh, you know, able to go away from home and uh, go to school or go to a community college first and, and then um, go away to school. So I think you can work while going to school and studies show that when you do that, you're actually going to probably have um, greater earning potential as you age because your, um, your, your work ethic has been developed, you're gaining experience, but you're also um, getting your education. So I think a combination of those two things are, are, are very important. And I, I think in our industry, people hire for personality, but they're gonna promote you when you're hardworking and you do take your work seriously and um, you demonstrate that work ethic. And in our industry, you can start at an entry level position and be promoted within you know, six months or so when you demonstrate that you are a hard worker. And it's also the food service industry is a, is a great place to, to um, start as a dishwasher and become um, a business owner. You can be a franchisee. So I think, but you have to, again, understand the business. So a combination of education and, and work while you're in school so that you build that experience. And, and getting a degree, you're not going to be capped. You're going to, there's so much more potential. Just having that degree. I, I mean, I, I think it's really important that you don't cap yourself. Mm -hmm. So you can start as a bus, 
dishwasher, uh, sandwich maker, but you don't want to cap yourself. Get your education um, and follow through on that. So much to learn. There's, there's so much. I, I wish I could go back to college right now because I, I would. There's a, a lot I need to learn. Uh, we are starting every roughly every two months now, training classes, uh, and our training classes are about six weeks long. And um, that's in general for reservations. So it's uh, reservations. Uh, basically, after about three, four weeks, you start getting uh, live on the phone with supervisors and so on. And what you learn during those six weeks is a very, very good knowledge of uh, everything about river cruising, destinations, uh, our reservation system, and so on. But that's really in our uh, in our office the entry level area and from there you have any kind of potential to move in any direction. We have several people in our office who studied in reservations and not that long ago, five, six years ago, who are in key management positions today. Yeah, but it is a good entry level. Now, why is it important to go to a hospitality school? and get a hospitality degree because it already shows that you are interested in that hospitality area. Yes, you can join from all different other, uh, with other degrees also, liberal arts and so on and so on. But once you come uh, from that uh, area, I'm, I'm sure you already will get preferential treatment because you already acknowledged of being interested in, in that industry. Yeah, we will ha we once once the whole thing starts. We'll have internships. We'll have plenty of opportunities, and we are we are close drive from here. Yeah, and it is a one thing about the industry, and especially this the travel industry. It is a fun industry. Yeah. As a result of, I will be with you in a second. As a result of this advisory board, which we have professionals uh, with that experience, we formed with Gerhard a basic program which is and which involves the laboratory, the real world experience where we practice and rehearse what you potentially expect in the industry. So you have classroom learning, you have laboratory learning, you have case studies, and as a requirement, you have to have field experience. We won't throw you just into the water. We talk about the philosophy of swimming. Uh, we have to practice that you get the toes in the water first. I come from a, a very poor family, rich originally, but then we lost everything in the war. I'm a perfect example of what you were talking about. The apprenticeship essential, I have all kind of degrees, but when you ask me what allowed me to be a leader in my field was the hands-on experience and the respect for the dishwasher as much as it was for management staff. And therefore, if you are patiently enough, if you want to learn the business, particularly you young people, um, there's no quick rise to the top. The best thing is to prepare yourself just like an athlete, mm -hmm. step by step, but without passion, you'll never make it. The experience comes by working in different places uh, and uh, to gain knowledge in every area, administrative, managerial, working in the practical field, and working like you. I really like this, Tom, how you engage with your people at all levels, uh, and you will have a brilliant career. It is so exciting. It's important to be financially independent, but if you don't have fun doing that, uh, life is not worth living. And I believe in our field, because it is a life, because it's encompassing, because you deal with all kinds of aspects of people, the wealthiest in the world, I, I, I dealt every day, uh, prime minister, film stars, but also with my dishwashers, and I love them as much as anybody else. So leadership and the respect of your staff has to be earned. You can't command it, and degrees will not give you that on its own. But if you can combine these different experiences, then you will have a lot of fun and be successful. You had a question, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm Joel Balby, and I teach uh, microeconomics in the Master's in Quantitative Economics here at Cal Lutheran. And uh, my question really is about uh, the impact over time of new technology uh, on your industry. We know you have challenges in terms of labor, uh, rising minimum wages, uh, other issues with uh, intermediation by high-tech companies that are coming in with different business models uh, that, that will challenge the traditional brick-and-mortar industry. So 
my question is, with, with these rapid advances in things like AI, robotics, uh, soft material robots that can work around people and, uh, and will ultimately, they say, you know, within the next less than 30 years, uh, they'll match uh, a lot of, uh, you know, average human intelligence in terms of having uh, learning algorithms and so forth. So how is this technology going to impact uh, your industry, uh, your companies, as it evolves and, and as it, it clearly becomes commercialized? Let me start. Sure. Okay. Um, if you look at the travel industry, <coughs> um, cruise lines, hotels, and so on, it seemed uh, 20 years ago that uh, People will just go online and book things. That so slowly the travel agents will disappear because they are not needed anymore. You can find it online, and the opposite is true. Uh, that segment of the market is growing very strongly today, yeah, especially on the upscale market, especially on the high-end market. People today want professional advice, yeah, what to do with their vacation and with their money. Uh, it is, if you, if you look at simply today booking a hotel somewhere in a, new, in a city, you could spend hours and hours and hours online, and in the end you don't know where to start. Yeah? If you go to a professional advisor, you can get that information f fairly quickly. Yeah? So that, that part, the distribution of travel in, in North America has been growing, it has been substantially growing, partially be because there are not order takers anymore like in the past. In the past, when you needed an airline ticket, you walked to a travel agency. Today, you do it online because you know when you want to go, where you want to go. But if you really want good travel advice for a good vacation, then you go to see your travel counselor, and that's counseling. You will really get proper counseling, you, and you come ha home happy. Yeah, so that part of the industry is growing. So that's the service industry. I mean, from the automation side, yes, there are, there are, there are challenges. But what I said before, everybody, fa all your competitors face the cha same challenges. You just have to be faster than the other one. We have an IT department of, what, 12 people roughly. Yeah, uh, the whole social media marketing is changing rapidly. You just have to stay with it and you have to try to be a step ahead of the other ones. Yeah, automation in general is good. Uh, it's not scary. Yeah, you just have to be able to manage it or you find good people for you to manage it for you. There's an Austrian economist uh, who you know, I'm sure you're the Schumpeter creative destruction. We will always have certain industries which will fade away and others which will take over. And the more menial jobs, you're totally right, will be handled by uh, robotics eventually. However, the more we have and the more we depend on the cell phone, the more we want personalization of service, the contact, the community, and you have to focus on this. Now, will be hamburgers eventually flipped by robots? Yes. But at the higher level, we still want the personal interaction, the customization of an experience, and I think that will never fade. Any other comments you yeah, might have? Yeah, I would have? say he's right on the money too. I mean, people want an experience. No matter technology or not, you're, you're still gonna go, at least I hope so, I'm, uh, I'm on video, so uh, in 30 years, uh, I could be wrong, <laughs> but um, I think people still are gonna want an experience. Um, internally in the restaurant, it will change. And we have to be willing to accept change. I mean, that's one of our core values is we have got to change, because everybody else is gonna be changing and you don't wanna be left uh, sleeping. I think you want to change so you can provide a better, more memorable experience. Absolutely. So spending more time with the customer, customi customizing your product uh, is exciting. I went up east to get my coffee from one place there were, where there was a retired lady who served me the coffee. I drove extra two miles because she gave me love. She was people friendly. There was another place next door I would never go. I could, it was just terrible contacts. So the stability of service, the ability of staff to maintaining relationships, what you said, Rudy, taking care of your staff. Labor turnover is costly. 
In my organizations, I challenged management. We quantified turnover. Nobody did this before. How expensive is it for which job categories a turnover? There's a price attached. And then we find out why do you have turnover? Was the hiring wrong? Didn't we take care of the people? Uh, and that somehow touches a nerve because a manager of an organization, if you run 50, 60, 100 hotels, doesn't want to be critiqued of actually being the owner of his staff and of his people. So the culture, however, comes and filters down from those who are in charge. We have three outstanding leaders here uh, and we learn so much from you. And their knowledge will come back into this case study here at our university, how exciting it is to work also with the economists uh, to see in which areas could we adjust uh, the value proposition. Any other points otherwise? May, uh, I, may I add something? Yes, sure. That's me, Alicia. Alicia, Up where here. are you? Oh, here. sorry. <laughs> A it's voice me. from the cold, <laughs> Alicia. Hello. So um, on our foundation works with high school culinary arts and restaurant management students. And um, we have to understand that technology is going to change the industry. So we're looking at, we do an annual competition. And it's a restaurant management and a culinary competition. And we're looking at adding an innovation piece to it. So challenging the students to think about uh, how they're going to create technology to improve the guest experience, to improve efficiencies, and to be a part of this change, right? Like, don't let it take away these entry-level jobs and make, make it more difficult for you to, to get those jobs. How are you going to be a part of the movement and the change? And so that's something we're looking at bringing into our program so we can help students think about uh, the the future and be forward thinkers and innovators themselves. Thank you. It also takes educators who change and adjust. Very often educators like myself or like Gerhard could very easily live in a silo and saying this is the way we have done it always. None of us would be here, uh, and, and I'm uh, doing a little commercial for Gerhard here, without the leadership which this program will have as a result of somebody who understands the real world issue politics of academia, the internationalization of service. It requires somebody who starts somewhere. When I came to Cornell, the, the first dean was somebody who had a vision about the hotel program. The odds that he would succeed were virtually zero. He opened up an office underneath of a staircase. He came from a home act department. But he had passion, he had love for the industry, and he was able to listen to the industry and adjust the program uh, to the industry and to the students of then. Today, unfortunately, my alma mater uh, has become highly MBA structured, uh, highly academic, highly driven by uh, you know, all kind of projects, and they're losing the service component. Here we have an opportunity to go back and to see what does the industry need. Uh, if I need medical attention, uh, I want to go somewhere you can save my problems. Uh, in Austria, yes, we had Sigmund Freud, but we don't need him anymore because we have the Stonehenge Inn, right, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> John, John Nutter will kill me. John Nutter will kill me. Because we have a place where we can meet and talk. And our new educational system has to be adjusted to the reality of the marketplace and how we can become relevant and educate students which will excel. There's a car company in my country. Uh, the family which founded it were good friends of my family. Uh, the car you all should drive, it's called Porsche. Porsche cars, one product, very small company, excelling being small. Small is beautiful. This program will need a start. You will start on a solid foundation, a good liberal arts program, an incredibly uh, wonderful alumni group and advisory board. And if we work together, we can do something where we can basically, excuse my French, kick butt with the large programs. So I'm excited to be part of it. Without further ado, I'd like to thank this panel and over the closing remarks uh, to Gerhard, but thank you for being here. I'd like to appreciate the young people. Uh, if you have any questions, we mean it. The reason I went back into business is to give back to the young people. I was mentored by one or two people who changed my life. They mentored me and gave a vision to me, and I followed them. Uh, you can exceed, you can excel, and to seek advice from professionals in the field uh, is a very good strategy for you to potentially pursue. But combining 
at UK. Well, oh, by the way, I graduated without debt. Uh, I married the day I graduated, uh, uh, solely for cash, nearly. My wife, uh, <laughs> my wife had had five hundred dollars. I had none. Um, so the deal was good. We have been married for forty-four years. Uh, so I can give you also some very good private advice. So with any further ado, thank you. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you.